tell me a little bit about who Greg Furch is. Okay. So I grew up in a small rural farming town in North Dakota. Um, my dad was big on those personal development lessons, personal responsibility. So I grew up working for farmers and doing all kinds of contracting work and so forth. I was pretty much responsible for buying all my own toys when I was growing up. And then uh, I went off to college and that was on my own also. And so I went to University of North Dakota. I received my Bachelor of Science in Human Biology. Uh, there and then I moved on to chiropractic school at Northwestern College of Chiropractic in Minneapolis and During that time my Army Reserve unit was activated during desert storms So I spent a few months working in a level one trauma center in San Antonio which was um, you know besides the sadness of people getting hurt it was an amazing learning experience um, that uh, I think shapes part of my background and, and uh, experience. It makes me uh, appropriate for continuing my role in the legislature. And when did you move to Idaho then? I moved to Idaho, uh, it's been, I started my 29th year on April 7th. So it's been a little while. I moved here from Minneapolis after I had graduated. I passed the Idaho State Boards, chiropractic boards, and got my license. And I literally left Minneapolis, drove straight through in a rental truck, and started taking over the office at 8 o'clock the next morning. So it was an adventure. Uh, bought the practice pretty much sight unseen. And that was 28 years ago, and it's gone by in a blur. Hope and a prayer, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, that's one thing I discovered that when you graduate, they quit giving you loans. And not only that, they sort of expect you to start paying them back. And so I was one of those people that kind of took that seriously and uh, paid my own loans back, every dime of them. But had I known the political climate nowadays, I probably should have waited and expected everybody else to pay them back for me. But Nonetheless, I did it on my own. Well, congratulations. And so it was your first term um, this past legislative sessions. Um, if re-elected, what would be your top three priorities? Well, um, I think it's just a continuation of what I, I started. I have a unique background, educational background. Um, we, we've had the retirement of the last medical doctor with Dr. Wood finishing up this term and it looks like I might be kind of the last man standing when it comes to a significant science clinical background. and. So I want to continue that conversation. My first days on the Health and Welfare Committee, we started talking about you know, things like vitamin D and actual health and actual nutrition because our public messaging as we were coming into the pandemic seemed to be void of that. And I was just reviewing an article yesterday that talks about vitamin D levels, it's what they call a meta-analysis of multiple studies and they show that the vitamin D level is significantly and directly related to the acquisition of COVID. And it was something that I was talking about pretty much from day one in the Health and Welfare Committee and then this article was published in July of last year. So months after we started that conversation, we're getting corroborating evidence that yeah, actual nutritional status makes a huge difference on the morbidity and mortality of COVID. We've known that for decades with every other respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection, but you know, nonetheless, now we have proof that what we were talking about in those conversations we started um, are coming to fruition. Uh, another thing I've noticed is that a lot of people that are native here and a lot of people that are coming here are coming for something. And it's much like, you know, people leaving other countries for opportunity. And Idaho seems to be like Texas and Florida, a place that people are looking to 
come to to get away from something and preserving those kind of ideals you know the freedom to choose your own health care procedures the freedom to choose the house you want to live in the cars you want to drive and not be dictated not be threatened with firing because you choose against a health care procedure um, seem to be very valuable and important aspects for people and I am a big proponent of those individual rights and being able to have dominion over your own body and, and decision process. So I think those are, are two of the things and then I would like to see a leveling of taxation policy, a balancing. Um, I'm not a particular fan of the um, property tax for instance. I would much rather see it gone away with, distributed elsewhere. You know, once you pay off your mortgage, you really shouldn't be held hostage to the Mosquito District and having to rent from them for the rest of, you know, your life as long as you own that house. And so, you know, maybe looking at some of those policies, taxation policies, health care, you know, just those liberties and freedoms that people are, you know, looking for and then continuing the conversation in a you know, holistic, real health model um, is why I'm seeking re-election. It seemed like it was pretty conversations about health care and that more natural approach were really well received. I had lots of conversations across the aisle and it seemed like I maybe became a go-to person for those sorts of conversations and I'd like to continue that. And you know, you kind of talked about it, but how does your skill set, you know, make you a good candidate to get those kinds of things or keep those kinds of things going in the state of Idaho? Well, again, if I kind of harken back to the education, you know, the Bachelor of Science degree in human biology, if anything over the last two years has taught us something, and it's that those subject matters have become really, really important, not only for the health of people, but for their employment and, and so forth. Uh, that's a skill set that I have. I, I've also been very involved in the Republican Party with multiple different volunteer positions. I've owned some rentals. I've been a business owner and employer for 28 years. Um, military experience, clinical experience, those sorts of things. So I don't pretend to be a one-trick pony, but I do have a measure of expertise when it comes to the scientific um, issues. I can have those conversations about natural immunity. I can explain and have talk about the 28 proteins that are actually in the COVID-19 virus and how building an immunity to all 28 as opposed to just the singular spike protein is eminently superior to uh, the single one. So that's the wheelhouse where I really fit. Um, again, I can still talk about you know health insurance and business regulation and uh, those sorts of things very competently. Um, so that's where I think I fit in. And, um, you know, as a candidate compared to the other ones running in your race, you know, what makes you stand out? What makes you think that you're the number one pick? Well, again, probably the uniqueness of that experience and education. Um, I know others have a great deal of experience in egg and egg related things. Um, there, tend, there seems to be a number of people that have those skills and that expertise, but like I've alluded to already, I, I'm pretty unique in that healthcare scientific world, and that's a niche that really, especially with the retirement of a couple of others, no one else is filling that gap. And so I think that really is one of the bigger differences. I'm. Uh, what would you say were your pits and peaks of the last uh, session? You know, what were some things that you were very proud of, and what were some things that didn't get passed that you wish would have? 
Well, you know, I certainly am a proponent of lowering the income tax, for instance. Would I have liked to have seen something, being able to come to an arrangement that mitigated the property tax? I, I really do feel for folks that are on fixed income and when the property taxes are going up, they don't have any place really to go for, for help. I mean, we can talk about adjusting um, you know, the homeowner's exemptions and things, but I think those are surface things. Um, I would like to see a more deeper review of that. I am certainly disappointed that we didn't protect people's, you know, individual right to determine their own health care procedures and not be, you know, I guess, coerced into things for fear of losing their livelihood and things. I think that was just grossly inappropriate um, that we didn't accomplish something more uh, aggressive in that regard and especially as we're seeing now that science and time is going on, you know, I mean we've got cruise ships full of 100% vaccinated individuals and massed individuals and yet they're still having outbreaks on cruise ships and U.S. naval ships and nursing homes where you know the protocols have been just die hard by the book and yet we're still having high rates of acquisition and and sadly mortality and I think it's largely because we have not had conversations about what it takes to be really healthy like the nutrition the vitamin d conversation and we've in my estimation missed the boat in two years you know we just passed a four billion dollar medicaid budget and virtually none of which is used towards you know actual health and those sorts of things are disappointing i know others are going to say well yeah the shot program is something towards health and I guess we do have a state website that talks a little bit about diabetes but there's not an overall conversation about individual health that makes that's making a difference. I had COVID. I we did a lab testing event down at the Capitol. I tested positive for the spike protein. I have no idea when I had it because I was completely asymptomatic because I chose to live a lifestyle that makes me or made me COVID irrelevant. And that's kind of a term that I, I coined and, and it's certainly possible. Others say that, you know, for instance, the shot is the only proven way out of the pandemic. Well, we clearly know that that's not the case. It's inaccurate. And I would suggest that I'm an example of how that is not true. Um, and so those are a couple of things that I wish would have passed and I'm glad we did pass as far as, you know, the income tax reduction. And, you know, we, uh, with redistricting, you're kind of in a new zone and unfortunately yeah. you're against another incumbent. What was your reaction when you saw that? Well, it was certainly disappointing and I wish the, the commission had done things a little bit differently. Um, you know, there was conversation about the validity of the map because of the county carve-ups and could it have been done differently with fewer carve-ups, which then possibly would have changed the, you know, the incumbent versus incumbent thing. Um, but the court felt differently, um, apparently precedent and so forth um, were not as important and so we ended up there and and unfortunately it created this competition that I I certainly wish wouldn't have happened. And the redistricting also kind of shifted your constituency. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel like you're going to be the best person to serve them and what needs do you think or what needs are they expressing to you? Well, it appears that the way the district laid out, um, I retained a significant portion of my original District 21. And so I, my demographic really didn't change that much, I don't believe. Of course, there's been a ton of growth in subdivisions and apartment complexes and stuff being built in, in my district right now. And those people 
are moving here and I've had conversations with numbers of them and that mindset about they're leaving other places for what they perceived as freedom and liberty that they're disappointed isn't necessarily guaranteed in, in a red state that maybe is more red than truly conservative and I've had a bunch of them express that angst. So preserving those ideals that people are coming here for and then preserving the lifestyle and those rights for the people that have been natives here. Of course, traffic and growth and all those things, you know, for me, uh, I live nearby and, you know, it takes five light cycles to get past Costco on coal and it's like, oh, please, you know. And so we do need to address the transportation and being able to flow the traffic. There are definitely a lot of players in that decision process, you know, ACHD and cities and, you know, those, those other agencies, municipalities and stuff, and I totally want to work with all those stakeholders in improving our transportation issues. But I would say that protecting the individual rights and, you know, transportation, traffic, those sorts of things are probably in my district, a couple of the bigger ones. And, you know, um, do you have anything else you, you want to tell the voters about who you are and, you know, why you think you're the best candidate for the job? Well, I think, again, it's the diversity of experience. You know, I've been here for 28 years, been married to my wife, Angie, for 21 years. We've made a great home here. We love it here. Um, but again, the, the uniqueness, uh, I don't have anything really negative to say necessarily about my opponent, but I do fill a gap um, that others in, and probably in the whole state really aren't filling. Um, and so I, I'd like people to consider that when they're voting now and on Tuesday, uh, <laughs> that we do bring uh, that different um, aspect to it. And my campaign catchphrase has been representation with a backbone. And being able to, you know, stand and stay true to some of those principles of, you know, minimal government growth, limiting the budgets, not in burdening our grandchildren with, uh, you know, excess debt and those type of things, and really not kind of being pushed one way or another. Uh, my my donor list is largely filled with individuals and you know a few small businesses a handful of other you know chiropractors and it's really a grassroots um, organization if you will with a number of you know civic groups that are concerned about you know liberties and freedoms and those sorts of things that have chosen to jump on board with me and it, it seems like it's quite an extensive list of those, I may not have the you know the big pack uh, backing, but I I'm pretty comfortable with having you know the regular voters and and people that were threatened with loss of their jobs when the hospitals created the mandates and things and that sort of thing. I, I'm I'm very comfortable having you know literally hundreds thousands of those kind of individuals you know, helping me, campaigning for me, door to door for me, talking for me, and I, and I just, I love that support. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on that I didn't ask about? No, I think just, um, I, the, the, the consideration and paying attention to, you know, the uniqueness of experience and education and the, uh, ability to have those scientific conversations and and speak to and understand the the research and the white papers and things that are put before us and you know educate uh, you know again we we had a little deal with baby formula that's in the news now and one of the baby formulas there is a resolution and that particular baby formula was 55% high fructose corn syrup. And I 
was probably the only one that thought to get out my government issued computer, click on the ingredients tab and look at what was actually in it. And it, it's really rough for babies, newborns, to be given something that is 55% high fructose, they call it high fructose corn solids, which is essentially dehydrated corn syrup. But to raise a baby from the moment they're born on refined sugar, you know, we're setting them up for diabetes and other things like that. And I guess those are the things that maybe I bring to the table, that, that uniqueness and the ability to spot those sorts of, well, wait a second here, you know, this sounds really awesome on the surface, but we got to dig into the nutritional, the scientific details of it. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the path we ought to be going down and at least have the conversation about that and then let people hash it out and where people fall when the vote comes. That's another thing, but at least we can uh, identify some of those things that might be a concern. So again, just the uniqueness, the, the different perspective, I guess, that the first chiropractor elected to the Idaho State Legislature might bring.